Thank you very much for that kind introduction, and um, it's a real pleasure to be here at UCLA. So what I want to do today is uh, give a, a pretty uh, broad introduction into the topic for those of you who might not have followed it closely uh, over the years, and then uh, talk about some uh, work in the lab that has been uh, focused on uh, adult stem cells in mice. And if there's time at the end, uh, tell you a little bit about uh, a new project um, we're undertaking to try to study aging in humans. So this work uh, began about 25 years ago in the lab, and it was uh, uh, driven by two new graduate students at the time, Brian Kennedy and Nick Ostriaco. Brian is now the president uh, and CEO of the Buck Institute in Novato, California. And uh, Nick has gone on to do other things uh, <laughs> in life. Um, but both were uh, a very uh, creative and uh, 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 driven students. And uh, they really made this early work uh, lead to something interesting. And what we were studying in those days was aging in budding yeast, which is what my lab worked on at the time. And we chose this system because uh, we thought it was tractable and we thought it was interesting. We certainly didn't think we were going to find anything generalizable about it. Uh, but, um, you know, whatever you choose to work on, it, it should be something that is doable. So that's why we chose it. And the way this works in budding yeast is that the daughter cell is new, the mother cell is old, and what you do is follow the, this mother cell in the microscope and push away the daughter, every cell division, and simply count how many times the mother cell can divide. And this was uh, a, a system that was uh, well established, and it was known that mother cells could divide roughly 20 generations or so. And then they senesced, and they senesced with a characteristic phenotype. They were enlarged, um, uh, sterile, also wrinkled. Um, so that was the model of aging that we were working with. And we spent about um, five years trying to identify genes that controlled this process, such that if we mutated the gene, it would change the lifespan as defined by this metric uh, in a significant way. And the most interesting finding that came out of these studies was uh, the identification of a gene called SIR2 as an anti-aging gene in yeast. So this is a survival assay of mother cells. And uh, you can see for the wild-type strain, the number of generations is on the x-axis here. And there's this precipitous decline in viability at about 20 generations or so. In this case, it's actually about 30 generations for this strain. And the importance of SIR2 is illustrated by the fact that when the gene is ablated, that lifespan is shortened. And when the gene is uh, uh, overexpressed here, two copies instead of one, the lifespan is longer than the wild type control strain. So that sort of focused our attention uh, on this gene. And we continued uh, working on it in yeast and uh, a paper uh, only four years ago from another lab, Jaswinski lab, did a study uh, that was surveying all the genes in the genome uh, for importance in dictating lifespan, and the top of their list was SIR2. So we've sort of uh, stumbled into an important gene, at least as far as yeast aging is concerned. Now, in the years uh, since, uh, a lot of studies have been carried out in other systems, including the roundworm, flies, and mice. And in these cases as well, uh, it turns out, uh, again, I would not have predicted this or expected it, but it turns out that SIR2 homologs, and they've been called SIR2ins, can extend lifespan when their activity is increased in these systems. So that means SIR2ins uh, have a broad effect to slow down aging and to extend lifespan. So we were interested very early on then in uh, what SIR2 did, okay? And its uh, history 
comes from something called uh, silencing in yeast. And actually, Mike Grunstein here was one of the players who identified uh, the importance of histones in silencing. And that importance is that the amino terminal tails of histones H3 and H4 uh, have lysines that tend to be acetylated on the epsilon amino group for active chromatin and are deacetylated when the chromatin is silenced. And SIR2 is somehow uh, was known to be involved in this silencing process. So that suggested right away that SIR2 could be a protein or a histone deacetylase. But many attempts to show that in multiple laboratories failed. So we uh, started working on that, uh, the biochemistry of SIR2, and we purified the yeast SIR2 protein and the mammalian ortholog of SIR2, and we're studying it uh, for several years, and came upon this activity, uh, which is an NAD-dependent deacetylation of targets. And so uh, what this means is that without the NAD cofactor, SIR2 and SIR2ins in general are inactive, and NAD is actually a co-substrate and is split every reaction cycle concomitant with deacetylation of the substrates for sirtuins. Now, those substrates uh, can be histones, and in yeast, the histones are certainly critical substrates of SIR2. But in mammalian cells, in addition to histones, substrates include other proteins in, other in multiple cellular compartments that can be deacetylated and that are important physiologically. So uh, Shin Imai, my postdoc, uh, and I were uh, excited about this finding because it provided a link between protein acetylation, metabolism, and epigenetics. Uh, it also had implications for aging because it gave a possible explanation for how a low-calorie diet or calorie restriction might extend uh, lifespan and slow aging. Uh, and we proposed that it worked by activating sirtuins. And uh, I think that hypothesis has uh, proven to be robust, as I'll get to in a few minutes. So with respect to acetylation then, this was the third uh, uh, and final, I think, class of enzymes shown to influence the protein acetylation level in cells. The first was the histone acetyltransferases, identified by David Allis. Uh, second was the HDAC proteins, uh, which are deacetylases, identified by Schreiber and colleagues. And these have no cofactor requirements, and the third are the NAD-dependent deacetylases uh, or the sirtuins. So in mammals, and my talk today will focus on mammals, there are seven uh, homologs of the yeast SIR2, which is shown here on this phylogenetic tree. The closest is uh, called SIRT1, shown here, and uh, I'll talk mostly about SIRT1 uh, today, and I in many senses, this is the most important of the seven mammalian sirtuins. And SIRT1, along with SIRT6 and 7, are nuclear proteins. SIRT1 tends to be uh, 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 in the nucleus, deacetylating many targets uh, off of the chromatin. And SIRT6 and 7 tend to be more closely associated with the chromatin, suggesting that uh, histones might be particularly important substrates for them. Now, what's interesting is that uh, another three of these proteins, or T4, 5, and th 3, are encoded in the nucleus but target to mitochondria. So three of the seven sirtuins are, uh, uh, reside in the mitochondria, and sir T2 is cytosolic. So is there a rhyme or reason to why there are seven of these proteins? Are they redundant? No, they're not redundant. For one thing, they reside in different cellular compartments. Um, one way to view this is uh, to look at uh, sirtuins with this uh, color key here and proteins that they're known to deacetylate. And many tissues uh, have substrates for sirtuin proteins, shown here. I'm not going to go through this all. But let me just point out uh, PGC1-alpha as an example because this is a protein that's deacetylated by SIRT1, and which, when deacetylated, can drive mitochondrial biogenesis and mitochondrial function. And in fact, if you go through this list, one of the themes 
that uh, emerges is that what sirtuins do in a coordinated fashion is they drive oxidative metabolism in mitochondria, okay? And so they uh, 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 force the cell to produce ATP via electron transport in mitochondria. Now, concomitant with that, they drive stress resistance to reactive oxygen species. So enzymes like um, superoxide dismutase are upregulated by particularly SIRT3 in mitochondria. They also drive uh, pathways that would be consistent with oxidative metabolism, such as oxidation of fatty acids inside of mitochondria. So I think that's a kind of an overarching principle. And note that uh, oxidative metabolism would be particularly important under conditions when the fuel source is limiting because of the efficiency with which ATP is produced by mitochondrial metabolism. So what about this idea that sirtuins are necessary for the effects of calorie restriction? Well, there's a pretty vast literature that uh, is in the hundreds of papers. I will choose one example here because it's particularly clear cut. And the subject here is uh, hearing loss in mice and calorie restriction. So what these authors did in this study is to examine hearing loss in 12-month-old uh, mice on the control diet shown here. So what you can see is that it takes a much higher uh, uh, decibel level of sound to elicit a response in the old mice over a broad range of frequencies shown here. And they're not even that old. These mice will live uh, past two years. So this is kind of midlife and already their hearing is severely damaged. And it's damaged due to uh, uh, oxidative uh, 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 destruction of hair cells in the cochlea of the inner ear of these animals. Now, what the study shows is that if the mice are age matched to the 12 month old, but on calorie restriction, they're completely protected against hearing loss. So that's good. That's kind of in line with what calorie restriction does. It slows down uh, uh, the ravages of aging in many ways. And the point of the slide is to show what happens in a SIR-T3 knockout mouse. Now, note that this mouse has almost no phenotype uh, uh, to uh, sort of casual analysis. It's just like the wild type. But if you look at it in this assay, you can see that the knockout mice is completely refractory to calorie restriction. Calorie restriction doesn't work in this mice, in this mouse, and hearing loss is observed. So that's uh, one point about the sirtuins, oxidative metabolism, especially under conditions of limiting fuel sources. And one reason that might slow aging, again, is because of uh, beefing up resistance to oxidative stress and oxidative damage in cells. Now, an unexpected uh, feature emerged. Uh, more recently, um, and that is that NAD and sirtuins are intimately connected to the circadian clock. And this was uh, a field that started uh, about uh, six, seven years ago. And the way this works is the following. So this is the oscillator that is present uh, in the brain, but also in peripheral tissues that oscillates with a diurnal cycle. And the nature of the oscillation is that this is a uh, transcription factor called BMAL and CLOCK, a dimer, and this transcription factor drives the expression of these feedback regulators here, which build up and inhibit the transcription factor. And this occurs uh, uh, with a site, and, and when the transcription factor is in inhibited, then the cycle is uh, reset, and this uh, uh, oscillates with a period of about 24 hours. Now, this wouldn't do anything to metabolism at all if it couldn't reach out and affect proteins that are not a part of the oscillator. And what these papers show is that one of the critical output genes that's not a part of the oscillator, but that's regulated by BMAL and CLOCK, is a gene encoding this enzyme, NAMPT. And this is a rate-limiting enzyme for NAD synthesis. And so what that means is BMAL and CLOCK oscillate, and therefore expression of NAMPT will oscillate, and therefore NAD synthesis 
itself is circadian and it peaks at the right time. And that means sirtuins uh, are circadian in their activity. And uh, I won't go through this, but there are also more connections between SIRT-C1 and SIRT-T6 and the components of the clock itself. So there's this really close connection. And I think that part of the reason for this is that metabolism uh, needs to be staged in a temporal way. And if it's not, things go awry. And there are many instances of, uh, in mice, if you damage uh, genes encoding <laughs> components of the oscillator, the mice have bad health. In humans, there's considerable data that people who live lifestyles, for example, shift workers, that mess up their circadian clocks are not as healthy, much less healthy. So that's another dimension to this, is that there's a considerable input into this uh, system that makes metabolism circadian. Now, what about diseases? And again, I'm still in this introduction part. Uh, in rodent models, uh, multiple sirtuins have been shown to be protective against a series of diseases, cancer, diabetes, neurodegenerative, cardiovascular, osteoporosis, kidney disease, inflammation. And the list is longer, in fact. So let me just say a few words about cancer, where uh, three of the sirtuins, T3, T4, which are mitochondrial, and T6, which is nuclear, have been found to be lost in roughly 20 to 40 percent of human tumors. So that means they're tumor suppressors. And how do they suppress, uh, how do these uh, proteins suppress cancer? And one of the major mechanisms, I think, I think relates to cancer metabolism, and particularly to the propensity of cancer cells to want to favor glycolysis, which is the Warburg effect, but also glutamine utilization. And so the connection then to the sirtuins is shown uh, in the left part of this slide. So SIRT6 represses glycolysis and also uh, ribosomal biogenesis. And those are two pathways that cancer cells need in order to grow. In the mitochondria, SIRT4 suppresses uh, this critical enzyme for glutamate utilization, glutamate dehydrogenase and thus rep represses glutamine metabolism. And SIRT3, shown here, uh, represses uh, several enzymes, by again, this is by deacetylation, that are involved in ROS production, so SIRT3 suppresses production of reactive oxygen species. So when any one of these three proteins is lost, then, the cell's metabolism is more geared towards tumor metabolism, favoring cancer. Now, on top of that, uh, SIRT1 and SIRT6 are intimately involved in DNA repair. And that includes both single-strand uh, break repair and double-strand break repair. And I'm not going to go through this in detail, but it includes repair at telomeres. It includes non-homologous end joining and homologous recombination. So again, the removal of one of these two sirtuins would create uh, higher DNA damage which again could favor a tumor, tumorigenic phenotype. Now the last thing uh, I want to tell you in this introduction is something that was found still more recently, and that is NAD is depleted with normal aging. So this is a study that was done in mice. So basically the data uh, is very clear cut in roundworms, in mice, and emerging data exists in humans. And what's uh, shown here is young versus old mice and NAD levels, very simply, in young versus old liver, and over here is muscle. And there's about a two-fold reduction in NAD levels. So you say, that's not very much. Is that enough to do anything? And this is a blot of PGC1-alpha acetylation in muscle of young versus old mice. And what this shows is in the old mice, PGC1-alpha is hyperacetylated. And the deacetylase that works on PGC1-alpha is SIRT1. So this uh, implies that uh, this reduction in NAD of twofold is enough to deactivate SIRT1 in these old mice. Now, uh, I'm going to move on. We could talk about why NAD declines, and uh, if someone wants to ask a question later, I'll be happy to tell you what's known about that. But it does decline. And the real exciting part is that this is actionable. 
And the reason it's actionable is you can replenish the lost NAD by feeding the animal NAD precursors. And again, there's a whole series of papers that show this. And uh, again, I want to credit Shin Imai, who first noticed this. And what he noticed is that in a SIRT1 transgenic mouse, the mouse had a phenotype, okay, which was in improved uh, glucose tolerance. But when the mouse got old, it lost that phenotype. Okay? But the protein was still overexpressed. So he wondered why that could be. And what he hit upon is NAD levels were plummeting in the old mice. And if he uh, supplied NAD in the form of this NAD precursor called nicotinamide mononucleotide, he could restore NAD levels and restore the phenotype to that mouse. Now it turns out that just wild-type mice, when uh, supplied with uh, nicotinamide mononucleotide or nicotinamide riboside, and R, have uh, an improvement in their health. For example, they're more uh, uh, resistant to becoming diabetic as old mice. And there have been other health benefits uh, described. So this then leads to uh, a notion that therapeutically, one can think in terms of activating sirtuins for health in two ways. One would be NAD replenishment, as I just mentioned. And the other way is something that was uh, found still earlier by David Sinclair and colleagues, that there are certain small molecules that can activate SIRT1, such as resveratrol, and uh, more recently, uh, compounds that are being developed at GSK that will be in the clinic in about a year uh, by binding to an allosteric domain in the protein. And these compounds, the stacks, will target SIRT1, but NAD replenishment will replenish the activity of all the sirtuins. OK, so that concludes the introduction. Went a little bit long, so I'm going to have to speed up. Um, so I'm going to talk about adult stem cells. And the stem cells are these uh, intestinal stem cells. So this is how the gut is organized. It's these finger-like structures called villi. And the base of the villi, which are, villi, which are called crypts. And the stem cells are at specific positions within these crypts. And they can divide to give more of themselves or to differentiate, to give all of the differentiated cell types uh, of the gut, which move up the villi and are sloughed off very rapidly. It's a very uh, a rapidly dividing tissue. Now, the point of departure in this analysis for us was a paper published by Yilmaz and Sabatini a few years ago. And they were studying the interaction between the intestinal stem cell and a niche cell called the panath cell. And what they found is that calorie restriction repressed the activity of TOR, and in particular, a complex of TOR called mTORC1. And that led to the panath cell synthesizing this small molecule, cyclic ADP ribose, which was then sensed by the stem cell to promote self-renewal in the stem cell. So that means calorie restriction gave rise to an increase in stem cells. So the study uh, carried out by Masaki Igarashi in my lab then utilizes mice that are either wild type for SIRT1 in the gut, shown here, or overexpress SIRT1, shown here, or are knocked out in the gut for SIRT1, shown there. And what we did is we looked at the effect of uh, calorie restriction on uh, all of these uh, mice and tried to piece together what was happening, particularly in the stem cells. So here's uh, an introductory slide that shows a cross-section of the gut in wild-type mice, ad libitum versus calorie restriction. And as Yilmaz saw, uh, we saw an increase in the size of the crypt due to an increase in the number of stem cells, shown here. With, when this was done in a villain cream knockout mouse that's specifically knocked out in the gut, you don't see this increase. And the data is shown here for wild type, crypt size increases, and the knockout doesn't increase. Now, the key experiment is this one here, where we're staining for this marker of stem cells to actually get a count on the number of stem cells. And what you can see is that there's an increase in the number of stem cells and calorie restriction, which is shown here, and that does not occur in the knockout mouse. We wanted to have a, a backup way to uh, assess this. So we use the mouse now where the stem cells are marked with a GFP 
driven by a stem cell, cell specific promoter, LGR5, shown here. And again, calorie restriction gives rise to uh, an increase in the number of stem cells. And if you knock out SIRT1 uh, in the stem cells, this time uh, with tamoxifen, you don't get that increase. So that backs up the histology. Next, we looked at the overexpressing mice that have higher levels of SIRT1 in the gut. And these mice now are fed ad libitum. They're not calorie restricted. And what you can see is the changes that normally are induced by calorie restriction are induced simply by overexpressing SIRT1. So this mimics the calorie restriction phenotype. You get the increase in the crypt, shown here, and you get the increase in the number of stem cells per crypt, shown there. So this is very nice. Uh, it says both loss and gain of function mutations in SIRT1 uh, uh, show that this protein is necessary and its activation is sufficient for the response of ISCs to calorie restriction in vivo. So the in vivo is, uh, I think, a pretty good foundation. So we wanted to know, what are the relevant cells for this? Is it the stem cells or is it the panet cells? And one way to approach this is to purify the stem cells and the panet cells, which can be done uh, by uh, marking them appropriately and then uh, sorting them in the cell sorter. So you have now a pure population of stem cells and a pure population of panet cells, and then you can cultivate them in this matrix and they give rise to these uh, colonies called organoid colonies. I'll show you a picture in a second. This is developed in Cleaver's lab. And what you can do then is uh, add a, a defined number of cells of one type or both to a microtiter well and count the number of these organoids that are formed. So these are the organoids shown here, and they are seeded by a stem cell. So a stem cell initiates the formation of one of these colonies, and then they differentiate to give all the cell types of the gut. And they're thought to be an ex vivo assay for the function of ISCs. Okay, so let's look at an experiment. Um, if you co-culture stem cells and panet cells, and the panet cells come from an ad libitum fed mouse, you get this number of organoids, but if the panet cells are from a calorie restricted mouse, you see an increase. This is what was observed in the Yilmaz paper, okay? This was the bedrock assay, that calorie restriction is activating the panis cells. Now you can ask the experiment, well, what if the stem cells, but not the panis cells, the stem cells come from a knockout mouse? No response, okay? So that says you need SIRT1 in the stem cells in order to get the response to the calorie restricted panis cells. However, if the panis cells come from a knockout mouse, they work just fine. So SIRT1 is required in the ISCs, but not the panet cells to get the effect of calorie restriction. So we began then to focus on the stem cell and to piece together the pathway of signaling. And again, I'll go through this uh, briefly since it was published uh, a month or two ago. Now, cyclic ADP ribose, the signal from the panet cell, is known to stimulate calcium release in the target cell. So we looked for many uh, uh, pathways that were calcium dependent. And we found that CAM kinase kinase was important in this signaling pathway. So here's an example of that. Uh, this is mixing stem cells and panet cells. This is the effect of calorie restriction here. And if you use a specific inhibitor of CAM kinase kinase, you block that effect. And a nice control to this experiment is instead of using calorie restriction to drive the increase in uh, organoid colonies, you could use the SIRT2 overexpressing mouse, right? Remember, that mimics calorie restriction. And when you use that mouse, then the inhibitor doesn't do anything. And so what that means is that uh, the way we interpret this is CAM kinase kinase then is downstream of calcium signaling, and SIRT1 is downstream of, of that. And if you have a gain of function mutation in SIRT1, it's now independent of upstream signaling, and you get the increase in organoids. The other nice thing about CAM kinase kinase is one of its known targets is AMP kinase, which is known to respond to calorie restriction in many settings. So we took a look at AMP kinase um, in uh, the CRIPS, and you can see that phosphorylation, which equates with activation of the kinase, is induced by calorie restriction, shown here, and it's induced in the SIR2 
sort of T1 overexpressing mouse, shown here. And furthermore, if you use an inhibitor of AMP kinase, then this increase by the PANIS cells in calorie restriction is blocked. And if you use ACAR, which is an activator of AMP kinase, it's sufficient to give the increase. So this, I think, firmly places AMP kinase in this pathway. And uh, lastly, uh, AMP kinase is known to regulate expression of our friend here, NAMPT, the rate-limiting enzyme for NAD synthesis. And in fact, calorie restriction shows a two-fold induction of NAMPT. So we can now trace a pathway that looks like this from uh, in the stem cell from CAM kinase kinase through AMP kinase, NAMPT, NAD, and SIRT1 activation. That's what we believe. And the question then is what's downstream of this? So remember the output of calorie restriction is to expand the number of stem cells. So we looked at uh, known pro-growth pathways such as PI3 kinase AKT or beta-catenin. And both of these in other contexts, for example, uh, colon cancer, play an important role in driving growth. But they're not in play uh, in the case of calorie restriction. We also looked at mTORC1, okay? And in particular, the signaling from mTORC1 to phosphorylate S6 kinase and to phosphorylate S6 to drive protein synthesis and cell growth. And we found that, bingo, this was the guy. And it's very surprising result because I told you earlier, and I'll come back to this, that mTORC1 is uh, canonically repressed by calorie restriction. And here it's upregulated. So is this true? Let me show you some of the evidence for that. Okay, this is looking at the relevant phosphorylation event in S6 kinase, in ad libitum, or calorie-restricted mice, looking at CRIPS. This is the same experiment uh, with in S6. Again, this is with CRIPS. We did the same thing with purified stem cells now. Okay, this is now uh, in, an uh, immunostaining uh, experiment, uh, looking at phosphorylation of S6, wild-type calorie restriction. You can see the increase is very evident, shown here. And from a knockout mouse, you don't see this increase. And you can also see it, uh, and this is a little bit heroic, uh, in a Western blot on isolated stem cells. Calorie restriction gives an increase in S6 kinase phosphorylation at the relevant phosphate, but not at uh, a non-TOR regulated uh, serine. S6, same thing. Now, what's really interesting is another substrate of mTORC1, which is called 4-EBP, is not affected by calorie restriction. So somehow the activity of mTORC1 is parsed so the calorie restriction is giving an increase in phosphorylation of one substrate, S6K, but not another substrate, 4-ABP. How is that possible? And we really were um, befuddled by this for some time. And then a paper came along, shown here, that showed that there was crosstalk between SIRT1 and S6K and TOR. And what they showed in the paper is that SIRT1 actually deacetylates S6K. And that makes S6K a better substrate for mTORC1. So we wanted to see if that mechanism was in play. And it is. If we look at uh, the effect of calorie restriction, shown here in CRIPS, we can see it leads to the deacetylation of S6K. And that requires SIRT1, not shown here. Also, if we look at the overexpressing mouse for SIRT1, it leads to the deacetylation of S6K. So what we believe is that calorie restriction induces SIRT1 deacetylation of S6K, this residue, and that makes it a better substrate for mTORC1, and that's why the signaling through that part of the pathway increases. So here's what it looks like then, shown here. SIRT1 is upregulated by these upstream steps I mentioned deacetylates S6K, and this uh, leads to protein synthesis and expansion of the ISCs. Now, we also believe, and I won't show data for this, but we could talk about it, is that the actual nutrient sensing here is done by the PANF cell, which is what senses that calories are low, and the stem cell then is entrained by the PANF cell via cyclic ADP ribose. And mTORC1, which normally would be suppressed in calorie restriction, 
is not suppressed. It stays the same, but its output is increased because of SIRT1 activation and deacetylation of S6K to make it a better substrate for TOR. Now, what about functional data? Is this true, or is this just uh, fantasy? So if this were true, then blocking these downstream uh, steps in the TOR pathway should have real consequences. Okay, so here's our, our experiment with the organoids. Again, uh, the control, the calorie-restricted pannus cell, give the increase, organoids, and that's blocked by an inhibitor of S6K, and it's blocked by rapamycin, the famous inhibitor of mTORC1. What about in vivo? So we've done uh, multiple uh, uh, runs of this experiment in which we calorie restrict the mice and either treat them mock or with rapamycin and ask what is the effect of rapamycin. Now note that uh, prior to this uh, study, one would have assumed that rapamycin itself would be a mimic of calorie restriction because that's how it was thought to act uh, and does act in many cases. But let's see what happens in this case. Okay, so this is the, uh, the data here. Here's the tabulation. Okay, and this is the crypt size. Calorie restriction gives an increase, blocked by rapamycin, shown there. And here's the, uh, the bottom line. You count the stem cells, and calorie restriction increase, and it's blocked by dosing the mice with rapamycin. So this is uh, interesting because SIRT1 and mTORC1 are usually working in opposite directions. So the genetics says that SIRT1 upregulation slows aging, and for TOR, downregulation slows aging. During aging, SIRT1 activity is thought to decrease, which is bad, and TORC activity uh, to increase, which is bad. And calorie restriction does the opposite. SIRT1 activity increases, which is good, and TORC1 decreases, which is good, but I just showed you that's not true in the ISCs. And a therapeutic, then, that would mimic calorie restriction would be something that would activate SIRT1, the NAD precursor or the STAX, or would inhibit TOR, rapamycin. But one would predict that that would not be a good thing for these stem cells and for the gut. Okay, now what about aging? So everything I told you so far relates to diet. Okay, I mean, but the studies were all done with young mice. What's the effect of normal aging on the stem cells in the gut? So we did that study, um, and uh, here's the data. So I'm just showing you the data on counting the stem cells shown here in young mice versus old mice, and the number of stem cells goes down from about five per crypt to about three per crypt. So that's consistent with what we think about adult stem cells that they decrease in number with aging. Now, interestingly, if we look at uh, by uh, immunostaining or by Western at signaling through the pathway I just described to you, so the pathway I described to you relates to calorie restriction. It may or may not play a role in normal aging. We don't know. We wanted to query whether it did. And in fact, if you look at uh, uh, S6 staining with aging, it goes down in the old versus the young gut. And by Western, you can see this uh, clearly. Uh, phosphorylation of S6K is down. Phosphorylation of S6 is down. And importantly, the levels of NAMPT go down with aging. So that's the stem cells. What about the PANF cells? Did the same thing, young versus old mice. And surprisingly, we did not see any change in the number of PANF cells in the old mice stayed the same, no decrease. We could also look at the function of the stem cells and the pennant cells by the organoid assay ex vivo. And I just look here. If we mix together young stem cells or stem cells from young mice with pennant cells from young mice, you get this. If you mix old, old, you get that. There's a clear deficit. Okay? But here's the revealing part. If you mix old uh, stem cells from old with pannet cells from young, deficit. But if the, the stem cells are young and the pannet cells are old, no problem. So by this functional test as well, the problem with aging is in the stem cells. So the stem cells seem to be taking the hit and not the pannet cells. And uh, 
Is this reversible? So we looked uh, by the organoid assay. Again, uh, young versus old. There's a deficit in the organoid formation. This is just the stem cells now. And if we supplement with the NAD precursor, NR, that's rescuable. Okay, so that's consistent with the idea that NAMPT is down and that everything downstream of that in the pathway is going to be down. So NR can rescue that. Furthermore, that rescue by NR is blocked by rapamycin, the inhibitor of mTORC1, and it's blocked by EX527, which is an inhibitor of SIRT1. Do the same experiment with now, uh, this is with CRIPS, with purified stem cells, same result. Uh, NR rescues the old purified stem cells, and that's blocked by rapamycin. What about in vivo? Um, the study here was then to take young versus old mice, and let's just look at this, which is the stem cell number, which is sort of the bottom line. And uh, old, you see a decrease in the number of stem cells. I showed you that earlier, and that's rescuable by NR in vivo which is really surprising to me that you could actually rescue that. Um, but I think, uh, nice. So the model then for aging now uh, is that the same pathway is in play here and that aging leads to a deficit that we can trace at least as far up as NAMPT here, which means that NR can come in at this level and bypass the deficit. And the deficit leads to a decrease in mTORC1 signaling and a decrease in ISC number and function with aging. Okay, so again, if we return uh, to the canonical view of genetics, what happens during aging and calorie restriction and therapeutic, we can see that in every case, what happens in the ISCs is the opposite of what one would predict by the canonical view of mTORC1. So, it's possible that the ISCs are the only exception to the canonical view, or it's possible there are more exceptions uh, that are yet to be uncovered. So to summarize then, uh, this part, the aging part of the talk, is that the wiring of pathways important in aging can be cell type specific. And I just showed you that the stem cells seem to be wired differently. And the implication is a drug to treat aging globally may affect different tissues differently and even oppositely. And uh, mammalian aging is complex. Okay, so uh, there's a little time, so I'm just gonna take a few minutes to shift gears and talk about a, a new project. Um, what I'm interested in these days, uh, not, not yeast so much anymore, or worms, uh, or even mice, um, but I'm interested in aging in humans. And um, part of that interest is of everything that's been found in the model systems, how much of that would carry over to humans, if any. Uh, and the other part is, is there a way to directly interrogate uh, humans um, to learn about aging? So this is a study uh, to study aging in the human brain that is uh, in its early stages, being led by a postdoc in the lab, Kristen Glorioso. And it's a collaboration. And it's a collaboration with computer programmers, okay, which include Andreas Fenning and Manolis Kellis, MIT, uh, and other collaborators uh, that supply us with uh, tissue and uh, data. And these are centers um, that have collected uh, banks of human brains, okay, which is what you need to do a study of this sort. And I'll note that uh, these first two banks are disease-free, so quote-unquote brains, and this cohort of David Bennett uh, is way towards Alzheimer's disease, some Parkinson's disease, but also some control disease-free. So here's an example of the cohorts and the age distribution. Uh, the Pittsburgh cohort has a nice distribution, many different ages here. NIH, pretty nice. ROSMAP, uh, the disease cohort, is a uh, very, uh, very narrow age distribution, skewed towards old. And GTEx, I'm not gonna say anything about today. 
So the region we're looking at then in this study is uh, the prefrontal cortex, and it's a particular region of uh, PFC called BA47. And the reason for that is that the brain is, is so heterogeneous with so many compartments that you have to focus in on one specific region. Otherwise, it's almost impossible. So what we do then is uh, it's very simple. We look at uh, genes that change as a function of age. And of course, there are genes that go down, like this, BGNF being a pretty important uh, uh, protein for uh, brain health, and that go up, such as GFAP, shown there, and identify these aging regulated genes, of which there's roughly a thousand or so in the Pittsburgh cohort, and most of those overlap uh, with similar changes in the other cohort. Okay, so that's good. And we use this data then to develop a metric of what we call the molecular age of the brain by, and I'm not, I don't have time to go through that, but basically we try to uh, break the data down into principal components and throw out the, the principal components that seem not relevant to aging and weigh uh, the principal components that seem relevant to aging and develop this metric. So what does it uh, look like then if we, let's say, compare the molecular age of the brain as defined in this way with the chronological age of the subject at the time of death? Okay, so here's that data for the Pittsburgh uh, cohort, molecular versus chronological age, molecular here, chronological there. And as you'd expect, uh, there's a pretty good correlation, okay? But what we wanted uh, is what you see, a correlation that's good but not perfect. And the reason is uh, we want to take for each data point, each data point here is a brain, the difference from uh, the regression line shown here and the actual data point to define as a variable called delta age, okay, which is the molecular age minus the chronological age. And that tells you how different that brain is from the average. So something above the line here is a brain that's older than the average, and below the line is younger than the average. And some of them are older or younger by a fair amount. It's a continuous variable that applies to every single brain. And we take that as a proxy for uh, the aging rate in these brains. Fully aware we're not measuring rate because this is not longitudinal. This is all cross-sectional. Nonetheless, we take this measure of delta age as a proxy for the aging rate. And our goal uh, long term is to find, identify genes and pathways that determine this aging rate and determine why this brain is aging fast and this brain is aging slow, okay? But what I'll just give you a little uh, tiny vignette today is um, how this uh, data, this proxy for aging rate, what it would tell us if we compared a cohort that had Alzheimer's or Parkinson's uh, brains versus disease-free control brains, what would we see? And uh, let me call your attention here. So this is from the ROSMAP uh, cohort, and these are the control brains here. So on the y-axis is delta age, minus means uh, molecularly younger than average, and positive is older than average. And this is the Alzheimer's set there. And what you can see is there's a significant difference between uh, the mean and the Alzheimer's brains are significantly older molecularly than the controls, okay? You can extend that to uh, uh, looking at amyloid levels in the brain, shown here, or tangles. So again, younger brains now uh, on this side, older brains on that side versus amyloid levels and uh, significant uh, correlation. The younger brains are more protected against amyloid. Same for Parkinson's, okay? So this would lead to a hypothesis then, one hypothesis, and there are others, but one hypothesis would be uh, that uh, uh, people whose brains have uh, age more slowly are more protected against Alzheimer's disease. And conversely, people with a faster rate of brain aging are more susceptible 
to Alzheimer's disease. Now, many of you would say, well, that's obvious. Okay, we, we knew that already. Um, but I think this is a more a rigorous uh, demonstration of that. Now, it becomes interesting also when you compare this to the known major risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, which is uh, the ApoE4 allele, okay, which, as far as I know, stands way above any other risk factor for non-familial Alzheimer's disease. There's nothing else even close. And uh, I'll show you a little data here, then, that shows uh, the relationship between delta age and ApoE4, okay? So we took uh, uh, the cohort and divided it into groups that significantly deviated from the average delta age. So this is minus five years is the youngest, uh, I think, decile in the cohort in terms of aging rate, and plus five years is the, is the oldest decile, highest aging rate. And the number of ApoE4 alleles is shown here. What you can see is, is, is quite remarkable that uh, this big risk factor for Alzheimer's, Apo, oh, it's what's plotted here is the relative risk of AD in the cohort. Uh, having one allele of ApoE4, normally a, a very significant risk factor, is blunted almost to insignificance in the young brains. So what we interpret this to mean is that slow brain aging can suppress having an ApoE4 allele, and that these two uh, variables of brain aging and ApoE4 are functioning independently. Conversely, in the older brains, uh, you can see that it's much higher, with no ApoE4 alleles, there's a higher risk of Alzheimer's, and the effect of ApoE4 is very evident. So one way of thinking about this, then, is ApoE4 is a risk to Alzheimer's, and uh, rapid aging a risk for Alzheimer's. And we also, uh, I didn't show you the data, but we asked uh, whether the ApoE4 brains, compared to control brains, showed uh, uh, more rapid aging, and they didn't. They were the same. So what we think, then, uh, is that these two risk factors are independent, roughly similar magnitude, and uh, together is the worst uh, combination leading to Alzheimer's. I list other uh, uh, phenotypes here, I think our data is strongest for Alzheimer's disease. So, with, and again, uh, what we want to use this tool for is to probe more deeply into the mechanism of brain aging and what determines it. So with that, uh, I'll stop and take questions, and I just will acknowledge uh, my funding sources. Uh, disclaimers here and Masaki Igarashi, who did all the gut work, and Kristen Glorioso, the work on the brain. Thank you.